Um, so uh, we're going to get, there's a lot of specifics that Hillary Clinton has proposed on higher education. We're going to get into uh, many of them in a moment. But I want to take one step back to start. What is the core problem that you see in higher education and that you are trying to solve with the policies that you put forward? Well, if you look at where our nation is going, we had some very good news on rising incomes last year. But overall, one of the central challenges that the next president is going to face is how do we help more people move into the middle class and how do we make sure that middle class incomes are growing? How do we make sure that that growth is based on sound fundamentals, strong productivity, and not a housing bubble or a tech bubble or any other kind of bubble? So, you know, we need uh, many more college graduates. And, you know, we've seen if you look back over the last century, we had very rapid growth in educational attainment in the first half of the 1900s as a result of the high school movement. And by the 1950s, an American teenager was three times more likely to be enrolled in high school than most European teenagers were. So we had a tremendous advantage in educational attainment that we've given away over the last 40 or 50 years. And that was one reason for our you know, rising prosperity, rising standard of living. Now, for higher education, you know, we have a, a partnership with states where states are intended to provide um, high quality, affordable, uh, uh, higher education. The vast majority of students go to uh, a four-year public institution or a community college, and yet we've seen states systemically disinvesting in higher education. And that's the number one reason that college costs have been rising uh, over the last couple of decades. So, you know, I think what we need is um, a new kind of partnership with states that focuses on affordability, that helps more students, and particularly disadvantaged students, which is where we're going to need to turn if we're going to get those educational attainment rates up, uh, keep student debts uh, down, make student debt affordable, uh, and focuses on raising completion rates. So that's the uh, big task ahead of us as a country. The, the cornerstone idea, the, an expansion of where she was during the primary and an adjustment of a central proposal from Bernie Sanders is the idea of free tuition at public colleges and universities starting for families at 85K, working up to 125K, or below. It isn't cheap. So what is the case for tuition-free public college, particularly for families that far into the middle class? Well, look, when we made high schools uh, universally available, not everyone thought that high school ought to be free. Uh, people thought, some people thought that it was a waste of money. Some people thought that we should charge tuition for high schools. And we decided as a country that we needed strong institutions that are open to everyone. Uh, that give everyone a chance to move forward together. And we also recognize that education, yes, it has big uh, benefits for an individual, and Chairman Klein talked about a million dollars, but it's also something we have a stake in as a country. We all benefit. Our economy as a whole is stronger uh, when we have more college graduates. So, um, you know, it's something that we ought to be thinking about doing together. Now, there are examples across the country of people moving to um, uh, free college systems. There's something like 150 uh, college promise programs that offer free tuitions. A couple dozen have started just in the last couple of years. And we see there is something very powerful uh, about the promise of free. In, in Tennessee, where uh, they make community colleges free, they saw a huge increase in applications, a huge increase in people filling out the FAFSA. And so there's a power there about drawing people into college um, that goes beyond merely the dollars in, that is required to make it affordable. Is part of the underlying theory in this proposal that a four-year post-secondary education is now what the 12 years of schooling were in the decades uh, after, you know, in the middle of the 20th century, the minimum that people need to succeed in the new economy? Well, I would say uh, we need many more people going to college and that includes uh, four-year college degrees. That could also include two-year uh, associate degrees. It could include uh, credentials that have high amounts of workforce value. Um, and um, you know, I don't know if it means that uh, we need 100% of Americans going on to college, but I think you can look at uh, the wage premiums for these types of credentials. You look at how they have much lower uh, unemployment rates. You look at how other nations are thriving by making these kinds of investments in education. And I think it's clear that we need many more. So let me rephrase it. Let me rephrase it. So is in the same way that we have funded 12 years of no cost public education for people on the theory that that is the minimum you need to succeed in the economy, it, it, are, are we now saying that some kind of post-secondary 
is what people need and therefore, you know, the community through government should fund it. That's right. We need many more students attending some form of post-secondary education and earning that credential. And you can see other nations doing that and prospering by doing that. So l let me ask a couple of specifics here. I mean, because there, there are a lot of kind of uh, devil in the details questions about, about an idea this big, as, a, as a big a paradigm shift as universal free public post-secondary education. One concern is that if the goal is to get to zero tuition, you basically will need to put more federal dollars into the, mo more federal dollars into the states that have traditionally invested the least right, and then have the highest tuition now, they would need the most federal help in getting down to zero. Uh, is there any way to avoid that? Well, um, you want to strike a balance. So you want to have uh, states being asked to do something that is within reach for them, but at the same time, you don't want to punish states that have done the right thing historically and kept, kept, kept tuition low. low. Right. Um, so what Secretary Clinton has talked about is, you know, fundamentally, uh, working with states based upon the number of low-income students that they're, and st students overall that they're enrolling uh, and graduating, similar to how we do with Title I and K-12, but also having some help with transition for states that are higher tuition. So you would build some kind of on-ramp to make it feasible Ooh. for those states that have a little further states, to go. States, though, would have to choose to participate, correct? That's right. So how would you avoid a Medicaid situation where you essentially have all the blue states and a handful of red states participating, and many of the red states saying, no thanks? Well, you know, that's similar to the situation that we have now, Ron, where, you know, we have an implicit partnership with states. And the deal has been the federal government will invest in student aid and student loans to make college more affordable, particularly for low-income students. But states have an obligation to subsidize uh, in order to keep tuitions low for everyone and make it broadly affordable. And the truth is, you know, at the uh, average state over the last decade, per pupil expenditures is down by $2,000, and tuition at public institutions is up by more than $2,000. Yeah. So it's no, and that's the pattern we see every time there is an economic downturn. Uh, states cut back, tuitions go up, and then when the economy recovers, they spend the money on something else, they just move on. And so you have this ratcheting up of college right. tuition at the institutions where most students go. It's the number one factor in rising tuitions. So what we want to do is say to states, you know, we're going to work with you to reset this partnership in a way that makes sense for both of us so that we're going to help you invest more and achieve something that's really important. But let me important. ask you, if we're saying that as a society we need many more college graduates, and obviously it is an advantage to the individual if we're helping you obtain this post-secondary, why should that right not follow the individual? Why should a Latino kid in California have a better chance of accessing that than a Latino kid probably would in Texas. Well, we're going to, we, you know, there are proposals in Secretary Clinton's plan that are going to help all kinds of students. So, for example, we're talking about uh, cutting student loan interest rates, refinancing student loans, expanding Pell Grants, making permanent the college tax credits. Um, those help not only help all kinds of students, but in particular help students at private colleges or students that may be paying tuition. So no one is being left behind. But when we're talking about uh, having a, a, a central route to affordability, the truth is there's no substitute for states stepping up to the plate. That's the problem we have now. You know, it's interesting that you use uh, the Medicaid example because um, over time, Medicaid rewards states for spending more. So, you know, the average cost to a state of an additional dollar in Medicaid services is less than a dollar. In higher education, we give states a very different incentive. We say, if you want to withdraw funding for higher education, we'll help backfill that with greater student loans. And so what we want to do is say to states, you know, we think that this is a real partnership where we need to be working together, and we want to have a structure that encourages them to do that. And, and, and so the, you, you think it's impractical to tie somehow this promise to individuals so that a kid in Texas would have an equal chance as a kid in California of benefiting from it, regardless of what the governor thinks. Well, we have programs that do that. Right. And Secretary but, Clinton wants to continue to expand those programs. But not this. But the missing piece is a piece to make sure that states are investing. Uh, you talk about, we're talking about states. What about colleges? You talk about, uh, you talk in the paper about pushing colleges to increase graduation rates. What are the most effective ways to do that, you think? To improve graduation yeah. rates? Or, 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 as, as one component of what you will ask of the institutions uh -huh. that are receiving this aid. Well, there's no one silver bullet, um, but there are a lot of things that we can do to raise completion rates that are also consistent with raising quality and keeping costs low. So uh, some of it is uh, high tech, and I, you know, I do believe that we will find uh, ways to teach students basic facts through software 
that is more effective than the traditional lecture model and also uh, less costly. Um, but a lot of it is kind of low tech and commonsensical and frankly things that we should have done a long time ago, um, such as the lack of alignment between different facets of our education system. So, you know, you have high school graduates have a B average, they think they're ready for college, but they show up and it turns out they need remediation. Or community colleges, which were founded over a half century ago to get people started on a four-year degree, but it's very, very rare that all your credits from a community college will transfer to the in-state public university. So you have states paying for the same class multiple times, you have students taking out debt, using up their, their limited Pell eligibility, take the same class uh, multiple times. So I, you know, I think with some state leadership, you can address a lot of those problems. Another, another area you talk about in terms of the institutions is the idea of skin in the game on loan defaults for, for colleges and universities. What could that look like? How, how, how meaningful could that be? Well, there's a lot of work to do to figure out how that's going to work. Um, but I think the concern is um, you have some universities um, that uh, whose graduates are not successfully repaying their loans, sometimes in very large um, numbers. And, um, you know, if you look at the relationship with mortgage brokers, for example, we determined, you know, in the housing crisis, one factor was these people were making mortgages to people who couldn't afford them and booking the profits and moving on. And so the question is, how do we make sure that colleges, you know, feel some responsibility to make sure that student loans are a good investment not only for students and for taxpayers, but for the colleges as well, um, and you need to do it very carefully um, because you don't want to give colleges a disincentive to enroll high-risk students mm -hmm. if they're going to serve them well. You want to do it in a way that gives them an added incentive. Uh, the ones that serve them well give, get an added incentive to enroll more disadvantaged students, um, which you can do by putting some of the money back in to reward those Speaking colleges. of enrolling high-risk students, one of the concerns, and the, and the chairman alluded to it, that, that has been raised about the free public tuition uh, proposal is this question of whether if you make it free to attend public university for families up to 125,000, you would have a lot of upper middle class shifting, upper middle class kids shifting from private to public options and that would leave even less room for lower income and minority kids at the most competitive public institutions. Uh, Anthony Carnevale at Georgetown uh, you know, said to me, for minorities and low income students, it will push them down the selectivity queue toward open admission and two year colleges where many of them go now to begin with. Do you worry about this kind of bumping effect and is there any way to design this, uh, this free proposal in a way that would minimize it? Well, you know, I have a lot of respect for Tony. I read your piece on this, which I thought was um, compelling. But, you know, respectfully, I just think this is really about how the program is designed. And, you know, Secretary Clinton's whole objective is to get many more students, and particularly students who aren't going to college now, mm -hmm. into, extra, into, into good colleges and getting them through good colleges. That's why her uh, funding formula to states is going to give them an incentive to enroll these students and help them succeed. And, you know, I just think the question of, uh, whether we permit um, states to game the system in the way that you're describing is really just up to how we design this program. Let me ask you two, two, two kind of uh, uh, long-term of possible effects, which I don't know how much you have thought about. One is just this question of when, when the baby boom went to college, mm -hmm. we built the State University of New York. Mm -hmm. We built the University of California. The millennials are now the biggest generation since the baby boom. We're not building much. We're not adding much. Capacity. Uh, one question would be whether the answer to this question of bumping mm -hmm. and access is simply, do you expect that if the federal government, if you got to the point where you passed this and there was a guarantee of a revenue stream for public colleges and universities attached to many more students, would they expand capacity? Would it make sense to expand capacity? Well, we talked a minute ago about ways that you can help serve more students, lower costs, and, and raise quality. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, those are actually things that go hand in hand, and most industries have found ways to cut costs and raise quality at the same time. And, you know, we used to say the only two holdouts were healthcare and higher education, yeah. and now we're seeing a lot of progress in, in, in healthcare. Um, I think the good news is, you know, for all of these questions, there are places that we have figured it out at different parts across the country. And so whether you are looking at, you know, some of the developmental education reforms that are happening in uh, Tennessee and other states, if you're looking at some of the cool uh, software that's coming out of Carnegie Mellon, like there are bright spots all across the country on how we can serve students better without necessarily raising costs. And we're just going to need to take a concerted effort to try and move some of that. Now, the, the other part of your question that I just wanted to point out is to the extent that you are funding states based upon the number of students you enroll, 
you are helping states like California that have done the right thing historically go a little further. And so they can make some additional investments in capacity and quality and try and help move those things along. Today we have about 1.9 million graduates uh, from four-year institutions every year. Would, do you expect that number would go up under this proposal? And if it did, are there enough jobs for that many graduates, or would you simply be diluting the value of a diploma? Uh, I hope it will go up. Uh, the number of four-year graduates also, the number of two-year graduates, the number of people with meaningful certificates. And you know, I think the labor market signal that we're getting, Ron, is that there's a huge demand out there for these types of workers. The, uh, premium for a, a college degree uh, is near all-time highs. Um, the unemployment rate is significantly lower if you have a college well, the degree. Wages for college graduates have not been, you know, until recently, right? I mean, they've also been pretty stagnant in the last uh, 10, right. Well, you have years, to, so you have to be a little careful. The gap has gotten wider. It, it, it is not going to address the problem of inequality that the people at the very top are taking a disproportionate mm -hmm. share. So there are going to need to be some other policy solutions alongside it. But if you are talking about how do we get more struggling members of the working class into the middle class with rising wages, that is what college attainment can do. A couple do. other areas of, of policy. And as I said, there's a lot of policy. People should go to the website and, and look at it because there's a lot of detail there. But one of the things you've discussed is a three-month moratorium on debt payments for all borrowers after uh, you take office if Secretary Clinton wins. Can you do that unilaterally? And why apply that to everyone? Uh, presumably there are some people on that list doing very well. Um, we believe that we have the authority for the Education Department to do that. Um, it has um, authority to put borrowers into forbearance um, if necessary. Now, it, it um, presumably would be something that borrowers would opt into. Um, and you know, Secretary Clinton wants to put in place these new mechanisms to help students uh, repay their loans. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's not just future college students, but we also have 40 million students out there, former students who have debts, some of them debts without degrees, some of them struggling to repay. Um, and moreover, you have the federal government profiting on those loans um, or booking revenue <laughs> off of those loans. And so we want to put into place a system where they have more repayment options that are more affordable, that are fairer to them. And that will take a period of time to get them into those options and help educate them. Is the expectation that you can move a large number of people into income-based repayment, current, current loan payers? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we're already seeing that. So you know, the number was under 500,000 just a couple of years ago. It's now close to uh, 5 million students mm. in pay as you earn. And I you would want that to go up. I think that's a really important uh, signal to send to young people, because we are saying to them, uh, you know, college is affordable, it's one of the best investments of your lifetime, uh, but they see stories where it doesn't pay off and people are shackled by their education debt. And so through pay as you earn, we can say to all students, including students at private colleges, including students in states that don't invest, uh, your, uh, uh, in your loan payments will never be more than 10% of income. So whatever is going to happen to you, we can guarantee that you're going to be able to afford those student loan payments. I read to Chairman Klein one sentence from the Better Way Plan. The Pell Grant is on a fiscally unsustainable path after having been recklessly expanded by previous Congresses. And he said, yep. What's your, what's your reaction? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know what he's looking at. The, Congressional Budget Office is showing large surpluses in the Pell program. Um, in a couple of years, the surplus is going to reach $10 billion. Um, so, you know, it is true that a couple of years ago we had uh, some difficult decisions to make to maintain the Pell program, but at this point, um, it looks like it's on pretty sound footing to me. And in fact, Secretary Clinton would like to expand that program. Um, to make it possible for students to get a, a third Pell Grant for summer classes. So right now, if you take two semesters, you basically have to take the summer off if you're a low-income student. She wants to be able to say, well, you can get another semester of Pell, and that will help um, students get through more quickly and help colleges and universities use their facilities more efficiently. So that's you know another way we can talk about increasing capacity. Bringing the audience in a moment, but there was great controversy over something you worked on in the Obama administration, which was creating a rating system, part mm -hmm. of an overall effort to promote more transparency and help families understand the investment they're making. How would a Clinton administration promote transparency, and would a rating system be back on the table? Uh, well, uh, I haven't spoken to her about that. Uh, it is not in her plans. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, uh, speaking for myself, all of us in uh, the higher education community need to be trying to build on this uh, progress. And we've just gotten through a couple of weeks where all the college rankings uh, come out. And you know, 
we have a de facto national system of accountability for our higher education that is called the US News rankings. Mm -hmm. And they uh, reward colleges for turning away students when really we need many more students enrolling in college and graduating. They measure uh, educational quality by the amount that colleges spend when we need colleges to find uh, new ways to help students learn more at lower cost. So it is pushing our whole system in the wrong direction. And you know, college presidents will sheepishly in private agree with you, but at the same time, uh, their boards, uh, their alumni, their students all like to see colleges rise into rankings. So you know, we all have, uh, I think, an uh, urgent need to get more information out there about how colleges are performing, how they're serving students from all backgrounds. Uh, and College Scorecard is part of that. Now, there's work to do to improve um, College Scorecard, but there's also a lot of work I think the whole higher ed community has well, to do. While we bring in the audience real quick, would a Clinton administration's posture toward for-profit institutions differ? from the Obama administrations, and if so, in what way? What is the next step of the agenda there? Well, I'll tell you what she has talked about doing, and, and, and we talked some about risk sharing, and uh, there certainly is a role for for-profit colleges. We see for-profit colleges, in some cases, uh, serving their students very well, serving adult students, uh, close ties to employers. But the problem is when for-profit colleges are earning large profits and their students are not doing well. So we need to make sure that the profit motive is being used in a way that serves students and taxpayers. Um, we talked some about uh, student loan risk sharing. Um, that is a way to use market mechanisms uh, to bring for-profit and colleges along and, assign, and align those incentives. Another market mechanism she's talked about is called the 90-10 rule. And the intent of this rule is to make sure that uh, at least 10% of colleges' revenues are coming from someone outside of the federal government that someone thinks it is worth paying for. Um, but the way the rule is structured now, you can count the GI Bill toward that 10%. So you know, you're getting 90% from the Education Department and 10% from the GI Bill. That's still all taxpayer dollars. So how do we apply kind of a market test to these programs to make sure that they are actually providing some value? Let's go to some questions. Thank you. Hi, James. Um, I'm Jennifer Pulikitis with the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities. Following up on Ron's question about transparency and accountability, can you talk a little bit about um, what potentially a Clinton administration would do to help advance a student unit record? Uh, I, I don't know that she's spoken out on that, that she has a position on that. Um, I do think that continuing to improve the data and what we know about uh, college students and how they, uh, uh, what happens to them after they enroll is very important. Um, I know there is a uh, proposal on, uh, in the Senate that's supported by both parties that would link state databases. Um, you know, and for the part of the education department, there's a lot of room to continue to improve the data um, that we are making available. So we now have uh, earnings outcomes by college. That's a very important step. It's the first time anything that's national and reliable has been available. You know, the next step would be to make that available by program because we know variation by program can be even greater than variation by institution. Um, graduation rates is another area where we need to do a much better job. Um, working on um, uh, tracking transfer students and seeing if they graduate. There's a, a promising initiative from the higher education sector called uh, STAM, the Student Achievement Measures, that a lot of institutions are doing voluntarily. And that's the kind of thing that I think we need to do together as a community. Uh, you asked one already. Do we have on the back there? Yeah, you see in the back? Yeah. Hi, my name is Chelsea Jones. I work with the American Honors Program. I'm really interested in the conversation around endowments. We know that there's a lot of money that exists in higher ed that hasn't been spent maybe on the students who need it most. We're talking about federal funding um, and spending for student aid money, but is there any need for schools with you know billions of dollars um, to use that to recruit students of low income? Um. You know, I'm limited by my brief. She has not spoken out on that. I'll tell you my opinion is, which is I think those, that there are a lot of, um, uh, is, those institutions tend to be uh, great institutions in a lot of ways um, through their uh, research function. They have really contributed a lot to economic growth. We're very lucky to have them. And um, when they do enroll low-income students, they tend to do very well there. They are generous with financial aid. The graduation rates are as high. The evidence is those students are as likely to succeed as their um, peers from high-income backgrounds. So I think that's wonderful. Um, you know, I do think it is a good thing when 
uh, some of those colleges that are not enrolling very many students that get Pell Grants or students from disadvantaged backgrounds look at ways that the, the look and see what they can do to try and expand um, those students because you know we know those students are better off when they go to the more challenging universities. So let me answer the perfect segue to a kind of final thought I wanted to, to address. It certainly has been a, the principal concern of, of, of the Next America project over the last five years in our higher education work. We know that kids of color are now a majority of the public school students, K to 12 in the US, and that in roughly a decade, they will be majority of the high school graduates in the US. But if you look at the 468 most selective schools, and this is from the Carnivale research at Georgetown, we know they're about 80% white, uh, essentially unchanged from 20 years ago and heavily tilted toward uh, the uh, more a kids from more affluent backgrounds. Uh, and that, 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 that and this increasing flow of African-American and Hispanic kids into higher education is mostly being channeled into institutions with less resources, less selective four-year and two-year institutions that don't have the money to spend on success that uh, the, those top institutions do. You alluded to this a little bit before. Is there any way, given the Supreme Court restrictions on affirmative action, is there any way to avoid the solidification of a two-tier system in which most of this growing body of students of color go to the institutions with the least resources and the, the, the most elite institutions that can invest the most, that get the best results partially because they invest the most, are still reserved mostly for kids you know, with the good sense to be born to wealthy parents? You know, r respectfully, you know, I'm not sure that's the most important question. So there are, there are some of these colleges that are working to enroll more students from low-income backgrounds, and I think that's a wonderful thing, and we need to keep working on that. Um, but those institutions um, are small relative to the overall size of our higher education system, and the amount of ink that they get is vastly disproportionate to their importance in the lives of most Americans. And so if our focus is on building upward uh, ladders of opportunity, building a stronger middle class and greater prosperity, we want to be focusing on places like Cal State and SUNY and Florida International University that are affordable, that are enrolling large numbers of students from all backgrounds, and that are really, you know, those are the types of institutions that are going to be building the future middle class. All right. Thank you, James. Okay. Thanks for joining us.